Today we're going to start Unit 4, which is um, a chemical bonding and structure. So today's lesson is um, covers sections 9.2 and 9.6 from your textbook, and it's basically an overview of different kinds of bonding, uh, which should be a review for all of you, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. So first I'm just going to go over the basic types of bond. The first is ionic, and hopefully you remember that in an ionic bond we have electrons that are transferred from a metal to a non-metal, which gives them opposite charges. So the metal will be a cation with a positive charge, and the non-metal will be an anion with a negative charge, and then those opposite charges are attracted to each other, and that's what forms the bond. In a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. Um, so this is co meaning shared and valent meaning the valence electrons. So this is sharing of the valence electrons, which gives you um, a covalent bond. And then metallic bonding is the last one. We didn't talk about this a ton, um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it in this class either. But in metallic bonding, the electrons aren't really associated with a particular atom. They're just sort of in a C around all of the positive nuclei, and that's why metals are so good at conducting electricity and um, conducting heat is because their electrons move very freely between one atom um, and another. Okay, so now let's just do a quick review of um, valence electrons um, representing those with uh, Lewis symbols. So if you remember, a Lewis symbol is just the symbol of the um, element, and then there are dots around it that represent the valence electrons. Okay, um, with Lewis symbols, we have the octet rule. So the octet is um, basically just a, a rule that we've made up that basically says that um, a, an atom is happiest when it has, a le or has eight valence electrons. And so um, an octet would just be eight, sh eight electrons in the outer shell. The exception to this is, or one exception to this, is um, hydrogen and helium. They only have a 1s uh, sublevel, so they can only hold two electrons, so they're happy and complete when they have a duet, uh, which is just two electrons in the outer shell. And a chemical bond is, in terms of a Lewis model, is the sharing of um, or the transfer of electrons to attain that stable electron configuration. Um, so in an ionic bond, it just means we move a dot from one atom to another, and in a co um, covalent bond, it means that two dots are written between two symbols uh, to represent that sharing uh, which creates a bond. All right, now I already mentioned uh, what the octet rule is. That's just um, basically states that it's usually the most stable when you have eight in the outer shell. All right, one thing that I did want to touch on that we didn't discuss in a lot of detail in honors about ionic bonding is the lattice energy. So the lattice energy is the energy associated with the formation of a crystalline lattice of alternating cations and anions um, from the gaseous ions. So basically what that means is if you have a gaseous chloride ion and a gaseous sodium ion, how much energy does it um, how much energy do you get when you um, put those together and um, they're attracted to each other and you form that lattice that you get with um, ionic compounds. So remember that in an ionic compound, the formula just gives us the ratio, and it's really just a, a huge lattice, a huge network of um, all of these atoms together. So it's not just one single bond like in a, a covalent compound. All right, so I also want to talk about um, how different... Um, different types of ions are going to have different lattice energies. So here we have um, ions with different size. So lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium are all right in um, group one. So as you go down, they get bigger. So lithium is the smallest and cesium is the largest here. And then chlorine, or the chloride ion, is obviously um, consistent throughout. And you can see that smaller ions have higher or more negative lattice energies and larger ones have more uh, less negative ionization energies. And so what that means is that the bonding between a lithium ion and a chloride ion is going to be stronger than the bonding between a cesium and a chloride. And this should make sense to you because we know that as you go down the group, they get bigger, and so that the um, nucleus is going to be farther from the negative charge uh, that you're interested in um, being attracted to.
right? And now how does the, the ion charge affect the lattice energy? So here we have NaF and we have CaO. So um, here sodium has a plus one charge and fluorine has a minus one, whereas calcium has a plus two and oxygen has a minus two. And you can see that you get a whole lot more energy when you form the lattice with the plus two and the minus two than you do with the plus one and the minus one. And again, this should make sense because Coulomb's law tells us that the attraction gets bigger when um, the charges get bigger. So the two factors are the distance, um, which we saw above with the ion size, and the amount of charge, which is what we're seeing here. Now let's just do a quick review of what Lewis structures are. So these um, we use as a model to show covalent bonding, and they're a really useful model um, and a very predictive model, which we're going to see in future lessons. So here, um, this is, again, just a review from what we did in honors, um, but lithium has one valence electron, so it's got one dot. Beryllium has two valence electrons, so it has two dots, and so on all the way across the periodic table. And so you can see that neon and argon being noble gases, without forming any bonds, they already have eight electrons, and so they're not likely to share or um, make any bonds because um, they've already satisfied the octet rule. So um, just some terminology that you should know. Uh, a bonding pair um, refers to two electrons that are shared between two atoms. All right. If you have a lone pair, that is a pair of electrons, two that are right next to each other, that are not shared between two atoms. All right. And then um, we can also, or we sometimes also refer to lone pairs as non-bonding electrons. So those two terms are synonymous. I should note that we also can refer to or can represent bonds using a line. One line equals two dots. So a single bond is one line or two electrons that are shared between atoms. A double bond uh, would be represented with two lines or four electrons shared between two atoms. And a triple bond, which is the most that you can get, is three lines or six electrons that are shared between two atoms. And we do have some cases um, where this happens. So nitrogen often forms a triple bond with itself, for example. One thing worth mentioning about these is that the Lewis structures... Uh, make it appear as if the electrons are shared evenly between the two atoms, and that's actually a gross oversimplification. That's not true in the majority of cases. So um, in honors, we talked about polar versus nonpolar covalent bonds. A polar covalent bond is one in which the electrons are shared unevenly. They are not shared evenly between the two atoms. A nonpolar one would be one where they're shared completely evenly. All right, uh, and what determines this is the electronegativity, which we talked about a little bit when we discussed periodic trends. So electronegativity is the um, propensity for an atom to pull the electrons toward itself when it's in a bond with another atom. So um, I've also often heard it described that covalent bonds would be better described as a tug of war um, over electrons between two atoms rather than the sharing of electrons um, because they're actually both pulling on them, on them in opposite directions. And so the atom with the stronger electronegativity would be better at that tug of war. All right, And then the dipole moment, which is represented by the Greek letter mu, uh, which is this little sort of you looking thing with a little tail, um, that tells us how much um, difference there is between the electrons in being shared between one atom and the other. So the bigger the dipole moment, the more polar the bond is. So a nonpolar bo bond would have a dipole moment of zero. Okay, and if you recall, electronegativity increases as we go from left to right on the periodic table because in a given row, we aren't adding any additional shells, but we are adding protons. So that um, allows that nucleus to pull more strongly on the electrons that are being shared. And in a similar way, when we go down a column in the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge um, doesn't change, but the distance between the nucleus and the outer electrons gets bigger as you go down because we, each time we go down a row, we add another shell of electrons. And so as that distance decreases, uh, the pull is going to get weaker because the electrons are further away. All right, and then last but not least, I just wanted to give you a pictorial representation of polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. So 
in a covalent bond, if you have two atoms that are identical, that are um, forming a bond with each other, you know that you're going to have a, a nonpolar covalent bond because two chlorine atoms are going to have the same ability to pull electrons, the same electronegativity. And so that will be completely equal sharing. If you have um, two atoms that have fairly different electronegativities, like hydrogen and chlorine, for example, um, chlorine being way um, over on the right side of the periodic table has a very strong electronegativity, and so it's going to take most of the electrons. So the electrons are represented by red here, so you can see that the hydrogen is bluish in color and the um, chlorine is reddish in color, meaning that's where most of the electrons are. Um, if the electronegativity difference is so large um, that the less electronegative atom can't hold on to the electrons at all, then what you end up with is an ionic bond. So this is basically a spectrum, and we, um, we arbitrarily have set cutoffs for what is nonpolar, what is polar, and what is ionic. Um, so it is possible to talk about a bond being more polar or less polar than another bond. It's not just it's polar or it's not polar. Okay, so that wraps up our review of the different types of bonding. In our next lesson, um, we'll go over how to draw Lewis structures, um, and then eventually we're going to get to how to predict structure from those um, Lewis structures and um, the properties that, that, that result from that.